Startling message found in Jerry Lewis's will. Family's dumbfounded. Jerry Lewis was beloved by audiences across the world for his natural comedic talent. Jerry Lewis brought a smile to millions of people's faces on television. But away from the camera, his personal life was positively no laughing matter. And it all came to a head when Jerry died in 2017. Even after death, Jerry was stirring things up, as evidenced by an alarming clause in his will read by his children. However, many fans were unaware that this was coming. To them, and the rest of us, Lewis was simply the amusing guy who could still make us laugh after being in show business for so long. Time was gradually catching up to the actor and comedian, though, and eventually it became clear that he didn't have much time left. Lewis had been battling heart problems for years before his death in August 2017 when he was 91. He died of heart failure at the age of 91 in Nevada. According to reports, Sandy Pitnick and adopted daughter Danielle were at his side in Nevada as he died. The dark secrets of Jerry Lewis's personal life slowly became public knowledge in the weeks after his death, starting with the release of the contents of his will. It was clear from the document what the comedy legend thought of his six other adult children, and it wasn't pretty. There could have been a dark side to Lewis that only his closest and dearest had known about. It appeared to be the case. And as he climbed up the ladder of showbiz, the star was able to conceal this aspect of himself from the general public. Growing up in an illustrious family, Lewis, real name Joseph Levitch, made it to Hollywood after years of hard work. Yet Lewis's mother and father were musicians as well. Ray Levitch was a prodigy on the piano, and her spouse Danny was a vocalist and dancer. However, before going to performances together, they had to leave Joseph with relatives. And the way his parents treated him by handing him over like this left an imprint on his life that would never go away. In particular, Lewis began to develop a sense of self-doubt. This drove him to seek attention from others, which is why he sought the attention later on. But long before he became known for leaving audiences and stitches, the young Lewis had another goal that he wanted to achieve. When Lewis's parents left for work-related travel, he begged to come along. While waiting for their answer, he started putting together shows at school. In the end, his persistence paid off and he got what he wanted to join his parents on their trips. Yes, when Lewis's father was offered a lengthy engagement at a New Jersey hotel, he decided to take his son along. But Lewis wasn't going to allow his father entirely to steal the show. At the hotel, he formed a comedy duo with the proprietor's daughter by lip-syncing well-known tunes while mouthing the lyrics. Jerry Lewis realized that if he didn't act fast, he'd miss his chance at stardom. He left high school and went to Hollywood in order to pursue a career in entertainment. However, he ran into a small problem. His name wasn't suitable for show business. Joseph Levitch sounded too boring compared to the potential of Jerry Lewis. Therefore, he changed his name so that it better fit with his goals in becoming famous. Armed with the new moniker, Lewis went to meet Dean Martin. The aspiring comedian was wowed by the singer, who seemed so confident, attractive, and, well, just plain cool. Luckily, Martin was also taken with Lewis, and despite their contrasting onstage personalities, the pair went on to forge a highly successful partnership that ran throughout the 1940s and into the 1950s. Lewis and Martin's distinct combination of music and humor won club audiences over. But fate was waiting in the wings as the unlikely pair performed their act at the Copacabana Club in 1948. A producer named Hal Wallace was in the audience that night, and he was very taken with what he saw. At the very least, Wallace signed both Lewis and Martin to Paramount Pictures. Yep, they'd both go on to become movie celebrities. The pair made their debut in the 1949 comedy My Friend Irma and went on to star in a number of hilarious films over the next seven years. Hollywood or Bust was their final collaboration together in 1956. Lewis didn't simply disappear from the public eye after he and Martin parted ways. He went on to have a successful career in Hollywood, appearing in many funny movies that solidified his reputation as a talented actor. But Lewis wasn't just an actor, he also proved himself to be a director and producer. Stanley, the bellboy in The Bellboy from 1968, not only played the main role but also directed the entire picture. It was the beginning of a slew of movies in which Lewis acted and both led and directed. In 1963, it saw a payoff. In Nutty Professor's release year, it played in theaters all over the United States. Given that Lewis starred and directed the comedy classic, just as he had done with The Bellboy, 
it served as evidence of his filmmaking talents. Fortunately for Lewis, the movie was successful. It made $19 million at the box office, which is nearly three times its original budget. Following his success, Lewis had a lot more work in Hollywood to look forward to, and he made the most out of it, releasing a film every year until 1972. From 1966 onwards, he also hosted his well-known telethons for muscular dystrophy. He was very productive, no doubt about it. It's a surprise he took a break in the early 1970s. Lewis made a comeback in the 80s and continued to star in many hit movies. He even landed a role in one of Martin Scorsese's films, The King of Comedy. Although he played a comedian, his character was more serious compared to Robert De Niro's Rupert Pupkin. Although Lewis was famously known for his wit, he showed the king of comedy that he could take a break from making jokes and let someone else have the spotlight. His role earned him much recognition, including being nominated for a BAFTA award. However, while his career was booming again, his personal life was encountering some chaotic events. Although he had no shortage of female admirers, like many Hollywood stars, Lewis especially cherished the few special women in his life. For example, before he even met Martin, he was introduced to Patty Palmer, and only a short while after their first meeting, they got married in 1944. Gary was born in July 1945, during which time John and Althea were married. He was followed by another son, Ronald, four years later. For a while, the family stayed together, and it was when the actor gained his footing on the big screen. Although Lewis and Palmer had four more children, all boys, as the comedian's career in Hollywood progressed, after Palmer gave up a promising singing career to take care of their sons, Lewis cheated on her with other women. Yep, Lewis was a cheat, and he would freely admit to the press. That's partly why his marriage with Palmer broke down. But even after the couple divorced in 1983, Lewis gave monogamy one more try and went again. After Sandra Pitnick, a Las Vegas dancer, became Lewis's second wife in 1983, he took on another family. Even though Lewis already had six sons, he decided to start a new family. In 1992, then, he and Sandra Pitnick added another member to their household, adopted daughter Danielle. After Danielle's father passed away, she was reportedly by his side. This act of devotion was later repaid to her after his will was revealed. As for his other children, they were likely surprised when learning about what the legal document contained. You see, Lewis had deliberately cut his sons off completely. The will explains, I have intentionally excluded Gary Lewis, Ronald Lewis, Anthony Joseph Lewis, Christopher Joseph Lewis, Scott Anthony Lewis, and Joseph Christopher Lewis, and their descendants as beneficiaries of my estate. Finally, Pitnick and Danielle inherited all of Lewis's $50 million estate. But why did the funny man go through with this awful punishment? And while there isn't a clear explanation for the sub, there are a few plausible reasons. Anthony claims that he and his brothers had a rocky relationship with their father. Yes, when the comedian's second youngest son spoke to Inside Edition in late 2017, he painted a rather disturbing picture of what Lewis had been like behind closed doors. According to Anthony, life inside his home was anything but ordinary. My dad would show up and park right in front of the big front door. My mom would get on the intercom and say, your father's home. Me and my brothers would scatter, he said. We could never predict his behavior. According to his kid, Lewis's son, his father had twice beaten him with a belt. However, the worst aspect of it for him wasn't that. It was everyday emotional abuse I suffered. It was terrible, Anthony stated during his Inside Edition interview. Then, after the film star died, just two of his sons were invited to the funeral. That alone suggested how contentious Lewis's relationship with his children had been. But of course, Christopher and Scott's attendance at the service made no difference in the will's outcome. In 1989, Joseph told the National Enquirer that living with his dad was pure hell. He said he'd tried drugs and therapy, but the truth still hurt. His father didn't love him. Can you imagine how devastating that must have been? Sadly, Joseph died of an overdose in 2009, leaving behind three children. Prior to his death, he and his father hadn't talked for two decades. His sons had never even met their grandfather, and that wasn't the half of it. Astonishingly, Lewis turned down covering Joseph's funeral costs, even though he could well afford it. And if that wasn't enough, rumors later emerged that the comedy legend hadn't wanted this story to become public. Perhaps fearing a backlash, he'd reportedly told his other kids to keep the information to themselves. Then, some 12 months after Joseph's death, Gary Lewis sat down for an interview with the National Enquirer, and he had a few harsh things to say about his father, just like his youngest siblings. Much worse, he appeared to imply that the comedian was partly responsible for Joseph's death. 
I believe Jerry Lewis is a mean and evil individual, Gary said. He was never warm or kind to me or my brothers. I'm not sure if Joe's death was caused by drugs, but I feel that it might have been prevented if they'd gotten along better. He probably died of a broken heart. My father doesn't really give a damn as far as I'm concerned. In 2014, after years of keeping silent, Lewis finally talked to The Hollywood Reporter about the accusations against him. He expressed sadness and grief over what had happened, particularly Joseph's death. I don't know why he went that way because it's unjust, Eldon explained. Not unfair to me, but unfair to him. He's going this way added to the stupidity of it all. He was my kid and he no longer is. And there's not much I can do about it. I beat myself a thousand times over this. You can't be decent with yourself, Lewis explained. Sam will come to me and ask, are we beating ourselves again? And I'll respond, a little. She'll say, you had nothing to do with it. You sent Joseph out into the world when he was 25. You sent what you thought was a perfect human being. And well, he did while away from you, is what the conclusion revealed. But I tell you this, you don't get over that. The final word, though, should go to Anthony. He admitted to Inside Edition that he knew he wouldn't receive anything in the will, but that the grandchildren's exclusion was the real dagger in his heart. I'm sorry I didn't get the chance to tell my father how much I love him one-on-one, -on -one because it would have been better than nothing.